Hello, and welcome to my lecture, part of the Growth Astronomy School on Observational Techniques for Transient Studies. I'm David Kaplan from the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee, our partner in the GROWTH collaboration. As you know by now, GROWTH stands for the Global Relay of Observatories Watching Things Happen, and we're an international team of astronomers that have joined forces to explore the dynamic universe uninterrupted by daylight. That's even more relevant in the case of this lecture. We use a network of observatories in a way similar to a relay race. The baton is passed from one observatory to the next as the Earth rotates and daylight breaks in different locations. This allows us to react fast when interesting explosions are detected and reported by wide field observatories, uh, by wide field surveys. But being fast is just one important aspect in the discovery process. The other one is to be able to look at cosmic objects at various wavelengths, each revealing different properties and physics. The lectures and tutorials in this school will walk you through various tools and techniques that will allow you to explore transients at all wavelengths. My lecture in particular will focus on radio data analysis with a focus on the data analysis. Our learning objectives for today are to learn how radio emission differs from optical emission and why that matters, to learn how radio analysis differs from optical analysis, and most importantly, to learn techniques for fitting models to data. So we'll start on the first one. How is radio emission different from optical emission and why does it matter? And we're going to focus on radio emission from kilonovae, merging neutron stars. So optical emission from kilonovae is thermal. The emission follows hot gas. It emits a lot like a black body spectrum. But radio emission is non-thermal. In particular, it's usually synchrotron emission. This comes from electrons that are moving very close to the speed of light spiraling around magnetic field lines. Each one of these electrons gives a characteristic spectrum that's shown by the upper right inset here. When you add up all of those for a whole range of electrons, you end up with a single power law spectrum that is very typical of non-thermal synchrotron emission. This happens very often in a shock where an energetic jet hits the interstellar medium. And this is similar to what we see in the case of radio emission from the first gravitational wave double neutron star merger, GW170817. Now, the plot I showed before was a spectrum as radio brightness versus frequency. This is now a light curve, radio br brightness versus time, although it looks pretty similar. It's a power law in both cases. But the important things to note and we're going to demonstrate the evidence for ourselves in the interactive Python tutorials associated with this lecture, are that the emission is optically thin. Basically, it doesn't block itself. That the emission does not evolve in terms of the spectrum all the way from the radio to the X-ray regime across the first 600 days where we observed it. And when we analyze the radio data, we can determine the jet opening angle the angle between the jet and the viewer, the density of the circummerger material, and how energetic the explosion was. These are highlighted in this cartoon here from a paper by Monsi Kosliwal showing how what we're seeing at radio and X-ray wavelengths is not the kilonova coming from the hot gas ejected by the merging neutron stars themselves, but an afterglow where a relativistic jet impacts the interstellar medium. Now, answering those questions gives us a lot of important clues about the nature of the explosion. And they are some of the reasons that we observe in radio and X-ray wavelengths. But in particular, radio observations of GW170817 have been able to do something sort of neat. 
Now, you might have heard of gravitational waves being used as a standard siren. This is a way of determining the expansion of the universe from gravitational wave data alone. You can determine the source distance directly from the gravitational wave strain. And if you combine that with knowledge of the host galaxy, you can measure the Hubble constant. You can figure out how quickly the universe is expanding. The problem is though, that the distance and the inclination are highly degenerate. You don't know if it's edge on and nearby or face on and further away. VLBI radio measurements of the jet allow us to break that degeneracy and go from the orange curve, which is our measurement of the Hubble constant using gravitational waves alone, to the blue curve, which is the measurement of the Hubble constant where you combine gravitational waves along with radio observations of the jet, and you get a much better measurement. So we'll spend a little bit of time, not too long, talking about radio analysis and how that differs from optical analysis. The angular resolution of any telescope, theta, is set by the diffraction equation, where theta is the wavelength divided by diameter. So for a normal radio observation, we have a wavelength of six centimeters, that's lambda, and a typical big radio telescope has a diameter of 100 meters. That gives us an angular resolution of only two arc minutes. That's pretty bad. That would be really, really blurry. And the emission, say, from a kilonova will be blended together with the emission from a whole bunch of nearby sources. Say, compare that to about one arc second for a typical optical image. In the radio, however, it's relatively easy to build an interferometer. This is where we combine multiple small telescopes. And so our angular resolution is set not by the size of an individual telescope, but by B, the telescope separation or baseline. So therefore, with something like the Very Large Array pictured here, we can easily have the telescopes 10 kilometers apart and end up with the same one arc second resolution. So that's really important but it has some consequences. So radio observing can be done during the day. That's great. That means you don't have to stay up all night. It also means you're not as influenced by the sun. Radio waves aren't absorbed by dust and gas. So you don't have to worry about really dense parts of galaxies where all the optical light will be absorbed. Radio emission also evolves much more slowly than the optical emission. Growth is organized around the idea of observing a source constantly 24 hours a day. But in the radio, we don't have to panic quite as much. We can live more leisurely lives, get up, observe the source the next day. That's usually fast enough. But there are challenges. One of the biggest challenges, which is only getting worse, is radio interference. A cell phone on the moon would be one of the brightest radio sources in the sky. You might have heard of giant constellations of thousands of satellites going into orbit now that are each a source of radio interference. We also don't get normal images from radio telescopes. It's not straightforward to go from what the telescope records to a good image of the sky. You can see this in the image on the right-hand side where you see these spikes extending out from the central source. These are caused by the fact that we have many individual small telescopes that we're trying to add together. There's a lot of techniques meant to deal with this, and I provided you with a number of different resources that would be their own whole week-long summer schools on how to understand this. What we're gonna spend most of our time on today is learning techniques for fitting models to data. And this is pretty agnostic of it being radio data. It worked for optical data, x-ray data, or in fact data in many non-astronomical situations. The basis of model fitting is comparing the data to a model. And we do that with this chi-squared shown here. What we do is for every observation i, we take the data, subtract away the model, divide by the uncertainty, square that so that it's always positive, then add that up over all of the different observations. As we change the parameters, we get a smaller and smaller chi-squared. The minimum chi-squared is the best fit of the model to our data. 
Now in simple cases, you can do this analytically. For instance, linear least squares. You'll take the derivatives of chi squared with respect to the different parameters, set them equal to zero, and solve simultaneously. Using this, you can get simple solutions for things like polynomials. But for more complicated models, you need to do something numerical. The simplest numerical way of doing this is just a grid. You get a grid of all possible values of all possible parameters, and then compute chi-squared over every possible place in that grid, and find the lowest value. This is straightforward, but it can get very time-consuming and expensive for complicated models. What we usually do instead is numerical fitting. For instance, Python's curve fit routine can fit for multiple parameters in a complicated model. And it works pretty well, but it's not perfect. It can be slow, and it can get stuck in a local minimum, like the one illustrated here to the right. This is where the chi-squared fitting routine might say, hey, the local minimum's pretty good. I'll just stop exploring there. But we know that if it were to move a little bit further to the right, it would find a better minimum where the chi-squared is even lower and we have a better absolute fit. Something like curve fit also doesn't incorporate something we call a prior. That's a way of incorporating other information that we might have about the problem. For instance, we might know that a certain parameter is likely to be big or small or linked to another parameter. We'll find ways to deal with this. What our eventual goal is, is to look at the posterior. The posterior is the probability as a function of all of the parameters. So I've shown an example of that here for just a simple two parameter search where I've been able to do a grid search like the one I talked about before. So the chi squared is shown by the grayscale. Darker colors are lower values, those are better. And the red cross illustrates our best fit. And in a paper, that we'll look at when you do the interactive Python tutorial, we're able to have few enough parameters so we can sample the entire parameter space with a grid. That's great. But what about if we had more and more and more parameters where we can't do the entire things? In that case, we might only want to search in regions of interest. We only want to really put our effort where the data want us to go. And the best way of figuring out where that is is using a technique you might have heard of called a Markov chain Monte Carlo. You let the probability itself determine where to sample the data. So an MCMC or a Markov chain Monte Carlo is a really powerful tool to explore multi-parameter data. You put the sampling where the data, where the probability drive you. So there's a little cartoon here where we were trying to sample a function as shown by the contours, and we let our little, little Markov chain Monte Carlo uh, robot evolve along the green curve and it samples around randomly, but eventually it finds its way to the minimum and spends all of its time there. You can use it for many different types of problems, integration, all sorts of things. We're gonna use it here for minimization of a function or fitting. Now Markov chain Monte Carlo is formed of two parts. Markov chain means each sample is only influenced by the previous sample. It doesn't know where it's been before. And Monte Carlo is because it uses random numbers to figure out where to go. So for instance, if I wanted to get a Monte Carlo estimate of the value of a half, I can flip a coin. If I flip a coin 100 times and look at how many came up heads, I'll come up with a pretty decent estimate for a half. The more flips, the better the estimate. So we will use an MCMC to fit a model to our data. We can efficiently sample multi-dimensional data and we can incorporate prior information. There are some subtleties. It is a tool, but it's a tool you can misuse. We need to make sure that we have enough random samples to really sample everything. We need to make sure that our final position isn't influenced by where we started. Fortunately, this has gotten a lot easier in the last few years. With the advent of powerful numerical routines like EMCEE, which is known as the MCMC hammer. That's a joke. Some of you may not be old enough to get it. Technically, it's an affine invariant ensemble MCMC sampler implemented very quickly in Python 
by Foreman Mackey et al. And I encourage you to look up the paper, but we're not gonna sweat the details right now. Now I've been using terms like prior information and posterior, especially when you go through the interactive Python tutorials, you'll come across these terms again, and these terms invoke parts of Bayesian statistics. So the important things about Bayesian statistics are that we have a prior, that is what we already know. What is our hypothesis just given the information that we think we know already? We have a likelihood, that's the probability of getting the data given other information, like the parameters in our model. Those are H, that's what we want to get out. And then there's that normalization factor, the denominator, we'll ignore that for this problem. What we want is what's on the left-hand side, that's the posterior. If we have the prior, we have the likelihood, and we integrate them over all values, we'll end up with a posterior, which tells us how likely it is to have generated the data with different values of the parameters. The data that has the highest likelihood, the maximum likelihood, is the best fit for our model. Now, as I said, when you're doing MCMC fit, there are pitfalls. MCMC fit set off different walkers to randomly explore the parameter space. The number of points in the resulting posterior is equal to the probability of that parameter being at that value. Now, we need to check that the walkers are burnt in. That means that they're fully exploring the parameter space and aren't being influenced by where we started. So you can see here that as a function of iteration number along the x-axis for two different parameters, they both started off basically at very small ranges, but they expanded and they're all randomly sampling things. So when we look at our results, we'll typically discard everything to the left of the red line, that's known as rejecting burn-in, and only have what's on the right-hand side. Those data are then well sampling the posterior. Uh, way to think about it is we want to make sure that our posteriors for each individual parameter resemble a fuzzy caterpillar. When we look at this, we'll also look at corner plots. We don't just end up with a single best fit value for each parameter. We end up with a full posterior range for each parameter. It also shows many multidimensional correlations between different parameters. And a corner plot is a useful way to explore this. It looks at all of the possible two-dimensional correlations between the different parameters. And then it can also look at the marginalized one-dimensional posteriors for each parameter separately. So for instance, the one on the right hand here is the parameter for the value alpha. We can fit something to that. We end up with a mode or a median that gives us our best fit. We can also get confidence intervals, say from the 68% confidence values that gives us one sigma limits. And for the two dimensional ones, we can look at parameters that might be highly correlated, like between parameter one and parameter two, or uncorrelated, like the ones between parameter one and parameter three. So our task today is to look at radio observations of GW170817 spanning 10 days to about 300 days at a wide range of radio frequencies. We will spend some time getting familiar with the data and making sense of it. We will fit some models to the data. We'll start with phenomenological models, starting simple and getting more complicated to figure out the spectral and temporal behaviors. And then we will interpret these models in the context of a jet plus cocoon model that was successful and interpreting the optical and gamma ray data. That concludes this lecture. Thank you very much for joining me. I'm looking forward to seeing you, all of this year's participants, on Friday at 1630 British Summer Time for our follow-up live discussion and hands-on Python tutorial. This lecture and the Python notebooks from the tutorials will be made available to anyone on our website after the school. Just head to this webpage to download our resources and play around. Thank you for watching.